Welcome to uh, our tutorial. So the title of our tutorial is on the event mining. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Tao Li from uh, Florida, Florida International University. And uh, here are two other presenters, Dr. Uh, Shiraz from IBM Research and Dr. Gladdy from St. John's University. So uh, here is the outline of our talk, our tutorial. So uh, we are going to uh, introduce to you uh, what do you mean by event mining, especially in the information uh, technology service management domain. We're going to talk about uh, event generation and, uh, uh, and also the system monitoring. And then actually Dr. Gennady will talk about uh, pattern discovery and uh, summarization. And then um, followed by uh, Dr. Schwartz will talk about mining with events and the tickets and then Give the conclusions. Uh, first one, we probably give you some background I, on the service management to uh, set the uh, back, uh, background on all the different technologies and all the uh, different kind of data we have. So uh, here is actually where many talk about service management, where this IT service management refers to the entirety of activities that are performed to plan, to deliver, operate, and control the IT services offered to customers. And in fact, uh, th this uh, service management actually happened in the IT infrastructure, can also be happened in the network and the communications. You can see that many of the technology we discovered, uh, we discussed today, can also be applied to other different domains. So over the last 30 years, you can see this IT service management has uh, grows very fast and the main products are booming from different companies. You can see a lot of companies working in this domain. So here's actually some background on the IT service management. Uh, you can see the typical uh, workflow of the IT service mainly includes the following components, including the customer service, even the database, ticketing system, and the system administrator. So here's how it works. Like you have the customer servers, and you have this monitor software running on the servers. And this monitor software will compute the metrics of the hardware and the software performance. For example, like CTU utilization, memory utilization, and compare this matrix with the monitor conditions. These monitor conditions are some kind of thresholds. If there's a any violation of these monitor conditions or something that over the thresholds, then your call the system generates alerts. Okay. If this alerts persists beyond some predefined uh, delays, then the, this alerts can be actually uh, converted to events. And this events from an IT environment will be consolidated into an uh, uh, enterprise council. So enterprise council will store these events, analyze these events, and uh, if necessary, you're going to generate a tickets inside of the tickets in the ticketing system. And the information in the ticketing system will be sent to the system administrator. If the system administrator can utilize this information for problem determination and uh, resolution. And after the system administrator solves this problem, the resolutions will also be logged into the ticketing system. So here's this is the general um, workflow of this problem dete detection, problem actually uh, determination and resolution in this IT infrastructure, IT service management. Um, here is a concrete example. You can see that uh, th those are conditions on the monitor conditions, which for example, in the example, looking at the disk utilization, looking at uh, the CPU utilization, those are monitor conditions. And so if 
if actually the the performance matrix actually violates this uh, thresholds, then you generate the tickets, and then have the events. This events will be stored in the enterprise console. Then you have the tickets and have this uh, system administrator to fix the problems. So this is uh, this is a general uh, overview of uh, the background on this uh, event. So from from the data perspective, we're looking at what kind of data are generated from the process. And in the process, you, you involve the people, you involve the information, you know, you involve the process and technology. But what are the data there? What type of data are generated in this in this process? So you have the performance matrix, which is mostly time series data, like what's the CPU utilization, what's the a throughput, what's the memory utilization. Those are time series data, and uh, in the system, you also uh, have this events. Uh, you have with timestamp, with event type, and with the description of, of what happened. And we talk about uh, if the events is severe and we need to fix them. So you have the tickets. How oh, this tickets? The tickets basically has the time and the message describe what happened or also possible resolution. So you can see that uh, we usually have hundreds of time series, different type of performance matrix. We have different type of event types in the system. We also have uh, the tickets can associate with different type of problems. And th those different category problems usually have hundreds of categories like, oh, this may be data database problem, oh, this may be a network problem, this may be a collection problem, or different categories. And uh, for the instance, for the ticket instance, you usually have millions of instances over time. So those are mainly three type of uh, data we have in this service management. You can see that uh, those data are basically of different types. And uh, how do you actually uh, somehow, let's say, make use of them to help you to uh, improve the IT service is kind of the task we're, we are going to work at. So um, traditionally, actually, in the system management domain, you want to uh, do problem when some problem happens. You want to do problem uh, diagnosis. You want to determine what the problem is. You want to resolve the problem. So those are called problem of the solution, diagnosis, and the determination. Usually, uh, this is uh, traditionally the labor-intensive process, and the system administrator uh, did another stuff. Uh, now the question we have is how we, we are going to optimize this process, how we are going to uh, using the tickets we have, events, and the system status data, use those data to optimize the process. So this is actually kind of a goal of this management, and it's it, uh, maximum automation of the routine procedures. So that's the goal, and, and that's, uh, this can be actually applied to many other different domains. Uh, you're using the data, using the uh, technology, using this uh, advanced analytics, trying to maximize automation. So uh, if you will look at uh, uh, different phases of the service management, uh, we can see that this uh, at service management can roughly divide into uh, uh, four phases. Uh, the first one corresponds to the sample uh, processing. Phase two corresponds to distributed processing. Phase three corresponds to we have many different uh, software packages, software uh, tools. And phase four is more like intelligence adding to the, uh, uh, the software. So those are from the data processing perspective. We can see that we have different fa uh, phases. So you look at the phase one. Uh, in this uh, this phase, the data size is really small in the megabytes or gigabytes. So people using simple tools or monitoring um, uh, package can do those. A concrete example actually is, uh, for example, uh, from the system logs, uh, we can do keyword search on the arrow and the uh, photo. And once you have those, well, sometimes you can use the scripts to doing the search, finding the problems. That's Phase one, and a phase two, uh, data actually have a lot of uh, different data there, 
and you have uh, those deep distributed processing in plan form or packages so you can use. Like from, uh, from the data processing prop perspective, you have collection, uh, you have, we have different uh, uh, toolkit, and from a storage, you have SDFS, you have a low cycle, you have a relational database. From data analysis, people are starting to make use of Hadoop, uh, Spark to doing those uh, processing, and from visualization, uh, you have the, you have different type of uh, uh, platform to do those. Uh, then from um, phase, uh, phase two, there's not too many uh, specialized tools. So in phase three, uh, there are many actually uh, data processing uh, toolkits appear, like Splunk, like this kind of ELK. So one thing about those ones is the product of very actually uh, sophisticated functions. However, their actually intelligence part is not that up to uh, the state of art. So uh, what I'm, we are envisioning is, what we are doing is trying to set up phase 4.0, trying to bring more intelligence into the service management. So uh, that's actually uh, leads to uh, kind of overview of the research problems we have. Uh, so uh, we, uh, from the workflow perspective, this is a workflow that uh, we just mentioned. So first part saying is we can see that in the monitoring situations, you usually generate a lot of alerts. And in practice, many of the alerts are false positives. So one of the key question here is, how do you monitor, uh, optimize the monitor conditions so that you can reduce the false alerts? So that's actually uh, from the monitor part. Then actually, once you have those events, we know that events are kind of semi-structured or sometimes unstructured. How do you analyze this? How do you actually uh, analyze those log files? So you have, how do you convert those log files into system events? Then one, once you have those uh, data, how do you actually uh, um, improve the problem diagnosis? So you can use in different type of pattern discovery algorithm, trying to discover correlations and trying to do a, a root cause analysis or different type of uh, function there. So this is from the, from the workflow perspective, looking at research uh, problems. And we can also looking at from the data perspective. And like we mentioned, we have the tickets, we have the events, we have this actually a, a, a performance matrix time series. From the data perspective, what are the possible research problems are there? Our first one, like um, if you have a tickets, one of the, one of the uh, uh, procedure to uh, maximize automation is given a ticket, I can automatically determine what type of the ticket is. So this corresponds to a kind of classification problem. However, in the system management, uh, the problems have a problem hierarchy. So there are many different problems that's different categories. So how do you actually classify these tickets into uh, different actually categories, uh, given that the categories have this hierarchical relationship. So this is one uh, one uh, problem from data perspective. The second perspective is look at the events. How do from the events? How do you discover? Uh, how do you actually convert? Uh, how do you actually uh, looking at correlations between events? How do you looking at their correlation patterns? The, from this time series. How do you correlate the time series with the events? Maybe your performance going uh, uh, changes is because uh, internal you have some events. So one of the questions is how do we actually correlate the continuous time series with discrete events? And uh, the, also there's a, a monitoring conditions, conditions that we talk about. How do you optimize the monitoring conditions? And also you, once you have a lot of tickets, can we make use of the tickets? Because the tickets has a lot of information about the problem resolution and the problem description. Can we make use of the tic uh, historical tickets? Trying to actually uh, optimize this process, uh, trying to recommend the possible resolutions for the new tickets. So those are kind of research problems that uh, associate with different type of data. So, uh, so today actually we are going to uh, give a tutorial on 
those different kind of research problems, looking at what people have done in this domain, and uh, also actually give some uh, possible applications. Some of the uh, solutions has gone into the uh, real products that actually make an impact. So uh, the first part actually uh, is even the generation and uh, system monitoring. So uh, the question relates to the, uh, from the workflow part is relates to how do you convert these textual logs into uh, system events? So uh, uh, the question is, uh, you look at the example here. Uh, this example uh, on, the, on the left, on the top left, is uh, log files that obtained from uh, a simple, actually, file transfer. So if you're looking at those data, actually, you can see that uh, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the um, red part is kind of even the timeline that generated from the log files. You can see that the system events are much easier to analyze when you have this even timeline. When you convert each of these messages into some type of events on this platform. So this even uh, this actually uh, converts the log files into events actually provide a very convenient platform. You can discover patterns. You can understand the behaviors of uh, different logs. So uh, that's why the first thing actually in, in many cases is you want to convert the log messages into events so that you can um, somehow describe the semantics of the data and then you can correlate the events from different actually uh, multiple components in the system. So uh, this one is the first one, first task. It looks easy. Uh, people see that there are po potentially there are three type of approaches for doing this uh, event generation. One is you can you can do look parser. You can write a parser for this. Uh, given given a, a system log, you can uh, write a parser. And the problem is you need to understand uh, uh, the logs. You need to actually uh, uh, document of the source code. Sometimes you need to have those in order to do those. And also implementation. Uh, given different logs, you have different parsers. So this may not uh, this may be time consuming. Uh, later on, maybe uh, glad we'll talk about this uh, generic log adapter, which is for uh, common-based events. Uh, then, actually, you can do information extraction. You can do in a supervised way, like you can classify uh, each log message into different event types. But this one, actually, as, as we know that, we need a lot of training data. So the uh, question is, uh, we can do clustering of the log files into different event types. And uh, people know that we can do a simple back of words model. We can do a, a matching of the terms, those simple ways to do those. But one of the problem is of the log file is you can see that even though this log, each of the log file is short, it's not many words. However, but you're looking at the vocabulary of this one is a lot. So if you're just simply using the back word or using this uh, message matching, typically the performance is not great. So uh, one of those two things recently people are doing is, can we utilize the structures? Can we utilize, um, if you're looking at each, uh, each of these uh, uh, log messages, you can see that log messages, you usually have some specialized format. So uh, there are two types of solutions, which is first one, we can looking at the structure of the log messages and using the structure to help you to do clustering. Second one is we can extract the signature of the messenger, sometimes referred to as, I'm looking at what's the template of the message. This message may be generated by templates. So the first one is, we call the tree structure based clustering, where each log messages, you can transfer into log struct, uh, tree structure data, where each load is a segment of a message. So for example, if you're looking at the, uh, this message comment, you can, uh, we can convert this message into a tree, very uh, similar to in, in electronic processing, like the past tree of this one. You have command, you have uh, the first uh, par uh, par uh, parameter, you have the second parameter. So we can uh, pass the, the log into a tree structure. Then what we can do is we can do a major similarity based on the structure. So in this example, you can see that 
we have this uh, gram uh, grammar parser, and um, uh, this this parser can be uh, uh, this actually a uh, tree can be automatically uh, created by JLK or JCAP in the J uh, uh, Java tools. And with this tree structure, you can have better performance when you're when you're classing log files. Uh, that's the first part. Second one is when you when you have log files, usually you can see that log is generated by some program. The program probably has a template to generate log files. For example, uh, in this I give example that uh, this one is log message. You first have the arrow, you have a client, there's the uh, address of the client, then you have this file doesn't exist. Uh, second, this second message, similarly, however, the, uh, the information may be changed. So given these different log files, we may, which we can see that because this file is generated by the program, and uh, although we don't know the program, however, we know that there may be a template that generates the log messages. So can we identify those templates? Uh, some of the terms may be the variables, like these addresses. Some of may, uh, maybe this uh, kind of IP address, those are uh, parameters. Some of them actually describe the semantic information, like the permission file doesn't exist. So can we actually automatically uh, from the log message, infer those signatures. So this is another type of work where uh, we're trying to find the key representative message signatures. Those signatures or some of the parameters, some of our really actually uh, uh, semantic actual words. So uh, this, this question is uh, given a message and a message is signature, then you're trying to, once you have a signature, then you can classify clustering the messages into different types. So uh, this problem is actually, we can do clustering based on message signature. And this problem is relevant to uh, traditional k-means. Uh, difference is right now I'm using signature, message signature as a representative for each cluster. So the question is, how do you measure the similarity between log files and the signatures? And in this case, uh, because those are sequence, so we can use in the, uh, we can looking at how many match the term and how many unmatch the term of, of in the signature. So that's actually a, a, a larger type of uh, signature. So these two types, actually we talk about clustering based actually uh, 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 log generation. Um, one is make use of the tree structure. Signal one is make use of a signature. So these two types actually uh, achieve a very better very good performance compared to uh, a simple clustering. Okay, so that's actually the first thing is once oh, you can convert the logs into messages. And in a related problem from the, uh, from the uh, monitor, uh, from the uh, uh, service management is we talk about uh, the monitor process. So one of the problem that happened in practice is how do you actually have a good uh, uh, monitor situations. So we mentioned that, uh, like the example we said, we, we did before, right? Uh, if the disk uh, uh, utilization is bigger than the threshold, then you generate an alert. So one of the questions is, how do you determine those thresholds? How do you determine those situations? So for example, here, this is one example. Like if process CPU utilization is greater than 50% and the duration bigger than 10 minutes, then generate a CPU alert. So one question we ask is, is this, is this monitor condition good? How do you generate this condition? How do you get uh, these conditions? And if you're, uh, for example, let's give example is, for example, if the RTV scan uh, program, the scan the system periodically, and when you're uh, scan the, the system, the CPU utilization is increased. However, uh, this is actually, uh, Periodical monitoring, the, then after a while, the program terminates. So if you're using this condition, monitor condition, in the system, you're, you're going to generate a lot of false positives, which is when this RTV scan is scanning the system, always have the CPU alerts. Okay, similarly, you have another uh, monitor condition, like the uh, paging utilization, in 15 minutes, it's bigger than 400. This general purging alert. So this one, 
maybe uh, for example, if some customer servers has multiple CPUs, have a, a much CPU memories, this may be very common that you have a lot of uh, memory swap. So one of the question is, um, if you're looking at, we have the historical data, we have, we know that many of the monitor condition, many of those alerts are false positive. The question, how do we remove those? How do we actually, can we monitor, optimize the, uh, the uh, monitor condition and uh, reduce the false alerts? So why we have this false uh, positives? Uh, there are many reasons, practical reasons for this, like, uh, when you configure the system, configure the monitor system, you don't want to miss any real alert. So maybe this condition you're, you're, you're actually config, configured is very conservative. Like, okay, if your CPU utilization is bigger than 80%, okay, uh, it's probably it's better to raise alert because you don't want to miss any real alert. And also, uh, if you change the monitor servers, if you have the transit alerts, like you have the temporal CPU requirement, if you're paging, you have a disk spike, and all those actually will generate a transient alert. So this is actually uh, 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 this is one example from the IBM t monitoring. You have this uh, monitor condition, how do you set those? You can see the very complicated to set up those conditions manually. So uh, now let's go back to our problem is or we have this monitoring system, we have this uh, existing monitor conditions, and they generate sometimes a lot of false positives. The question is, can we remove those false positives? Can we reduce, at least reduce some of those false positives? Um, we're trying to eliminate the false positives by refining the monitor conditions. So there's a, there's a challenge here is, we don't want to miss any real alerts, okay? Uh, we want to return all real alerts. So people may see that it's easy, okay? What you do is I'm building a classifier. Uh, when you have alerts, I'm gonna classify if this alert is false positive or not false positive. Oh, uh, if it's false positive, and I'm gonna remove. If it's not false positive, I'm gonna keep those. Uh, this one is simple, actually. Uh, the question is, uh, the computer classifier, for example, I'm using supportable machine, I'm using someone who has achieved 99% accuracy. But however, those 90, 95% uh, percent accuracy doesn't make sense because you still will miss, you have a small chance you're gonna miss real alerts. So the question is, how to do those? Because low classifier can have 100% accuracy, okay? Uh, so if you're looking at a related work, people have been using this monitor products, people have been using this uh, supervised learning or outline detection or use uh, uh, classification methods. And as we said that, it's probably good to publish papers, but none of them can be applied to real scenario because uh, no classifier can guarantee that you have 100% accuracy, so which means if you're using that classification-based approach, there's a chance, more chance, no matter how accurate of your classifier, that you may classify alert is a false positive to be not false positive. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, here's uh, something we did. Uh, we look in this case is uh, we know that we uh, we can we cannot remove all those. So what we do is we go back. We're looking at the historical data. We're looking at our false positives, okay? We're looking at most of the false positives are transient alerts, and they were going to automatically disappear in a short time, like a temporal spike, like we just mentioned with uh, a virus scan. Those generate alerts, those, those are transient, which means they're going to disappear uh, in a short time. So, our motivation here is, okay, so we're, gonna, we're not going to uh, remove all the false positives. What, ha what, what, what can we do is, maybe we can remove some of those transient alerts. So this leads our uh, kind of workflow solution for this problem. We still build a classifier, but we actually um, have a small trick here. So given uh, alerts, what we're gonna do is, 
uh, we still going to build a classifier trying to predict is this a false alert or not a false alert. Uh, if it's a false, if it's not a false alert, okay, we are going to create a ticket. Okay, if it's a false, false positive, what we do is we are going to wait a little bit. We are going to wait some time. We are waiting to see that is this alert automatically disappear. If not, we are going to create a ticket. If it disappear, let's just remove the remove the uh, the event. So this one is still the same um, same actually uh, uh, idea of we are still using a classifier to do those. But however, we have this uh, because we understand from the data we understand the property of the false positive because most of false positive are transient. So which means they're going to dis disappear anyway in a short time. So with this understanding of data, then we can come up with uh, the procedure where if we predict is false positive, let's hold a little bit and wait to see that maybe if after a while this, this ticket will clear, disappear, disappear. So this is actually a very, uh, I think a very interesting observation when we, when we, when we actually apply uh, uh, develop data mining techniques to, uh, to solve a real problem where we have to looking at the data characteristics instead of just blindly apply those things. And this will actually make a big, I think a big impact in the, in the product. And uh, one, technique con uh, one technique actually condition here is how long shall we wait? Shall we wait one minute? Shall we wait two minutes? So uh, there's, uh, some uh, there's some consideration of the service level agreements and to determine the waiting time. So, uh, uh, so implementation wise, and, uh, and we are using the rule-based uh, classifier to classify, because why we use rule-based classifier here? Because those rules are corresponds to monitor condition. So you can see that the rules generated by a classifier can be directly translated into monitor conditions if CPU and process name. So for example, oh, we can have this condition. If process time uh, greater than 50% and process name is RTV scan, we know this one is a wireless scan uh, program, so which can take time. Then this actually alert may be false. Okay, the waiting time is the pulling interval of the monitor situation. So we're going to determine the waiting time based on the real actually uh, uh, agreements. And you can see that with this simple idea of, uh, of this removing false positive, you can see that uh, in the figure here, you can see how many um, uh, we elim uh, eliminate a lot of false uh, tickets. And uh, when, when this one actually use, using to, uh, to the real system, it can save a lot of time, a lot of uh, human efforts. Uh, so actually if we have this false, uh, uh, false positives, then in the meantime, uh, we have the false selectives. So what do you mean by false selective? False positive is your general alert, but this alert is false. Uh, false selective means you do not generate any alert. However, when the actually system, uh, or when the, in a ticketing system, you have a ticket about this problem. So which means the false selective means uh, the problem that does not capture by the monitor condition, and, but appeared in the ticketing system. So this one actually, uh, so the four selectives are not recorded in the monitor events, but only in manual tickets. So one of the problem is, can we remove those uh, four selectives? Uh, different from false positives, false positives are allowed. Maybe uh, each day generate hundreds, thousands of false alerts, but the false, pos uh, false selectives is very few. So uh, why we would have this false selectives? Or uh, maybe if a new device and a software are installed, and but, uh, but not added into the monitor configurations, then definitely you're going to not, not going to generate the, the uh, uh, capture of the problem there. Or if you have a change of the existing system, some thresholds may not be uh, acceptable to after changes. So if you have a system change, then the monitor, monitor configurations does not change accordingly. 
So then you may have the problem of the false negative. So how do you solve this problem here? How do you eliminate the false negatives? And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, different from the false positives, false negatives are few. Maybe like, like 20 to 40 tickets for a situation. Uh, so this one is, uh, we don't need to uh, automatically to correct the misconfiguration because you are earning of 20 or something, then, then the system administrator can manually to, to create the misconfiguration. However, you need to discover that from the tickets, that those tickets are associated with uh, four selectives. So the problem here is we want to from the manual tickets. The manual tickets can be huge. From the tickets, what are the problems contain the situations that are not recorded uh, that actually are not captured by alerts. So this is a, a different challenge. We, can, we need to automatically identify the related manual tickets and give those tickets to the system administrator, ask them to refine the misconfiguration. So that's uh, how do you eliminate the false selectives? By refining the monitor condition, it concerns the two parts. First one is trying to scan the historical tickets, manual tickets, and provide a short list of potential false selectives to the monitor condition. And then you change the, condition, uh, change the uh, situations. So there are many uh, work around this di uh, direction, trying to uh, reduce the false selectives. However, there is no prior work on how do you discover from the manual tickets what are those uh, situations a lot captured in the monitor condition. So uh, here, uh, we, what we do is we're still using this uh, classification method, which is trying to classify a manual ticket, whether this one is relevant to a problem or not. So this is uh, also uh, a two stage classification which combine active learning from the uh, from the words and uh, the classification on the uh, on the tickets so given each situations we identify uh, words that are associated with the situation then ask people to label what are those tickets that possibly related to the problem then actually to use this one to uh, uh, to label the tickets so we can we can see that there's a uh, Here's uh, some actually uh, situation, uh, how do we optimize situation from the events and tickets. On the left, we see that a uh, typical example of first positive. Uh, if your CPU utilization grade 80% duration equal to one, and this situation has been optimized to, uh, we also need to consider different actually uh, process name and different durations. So with this simple change, and we can reduce a lot of for selective force alerts, and this one can also be made into uh, uh, real products. And for the force selective, we actually identify a few uh, a few tickets which which has not been actually uh, uh, events which has not been captured by the monitor system, and this leads to refine the optim uh, monitor situation to refine uh, the situations. And uh, any questions? Yes. Yes. So I understood that you uh, have this more waiting time to remove yes. those. What about, or I don't know if it makes sense or not, to not only remove those, that's fine, but to improve the threshold services. So not grading 50%, but greater than 27%. Yes, yes, actually, uh, that that's, yes. Yeah, well, actually, we have been looking yeah, at those. That was done, yes. Yeah. We still do work. In the process, we work. Okay. But it's still from last year, right? Because I don't know whether why not build in, um, so you're effectively bringing, considering this lag of creating this new group rather than just trust that maybe you're getting about 100% of the waiting list as well. Why not have a longer data lane to give it both different? Process 
Yeah, I think that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> yeah, it's actually your. Uh, that's the ultimate goal, right? We're trying to optimize the full pipeline, and uh, so we we has to go this step by step based on the available data we have and available technology we have. So you are going to see a few more um, along this direction, and uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, transfer to uh, my colleague, uh, Gladi, Dr. Gladi, to talk about. The second part. Okay. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> My name is Gennady. Okay. So we will talk here about pattern discovery and summarization. And I will give you a short overview to strengthen whatever uh, Tauli, Professor Tauli was talking about uh, with a brief history. Okay. I think it's strengthened and shows you. Uh, Usually how you start working, you have a problem, you're trying to solve it, you move to the next one, that's it. But the history shows that this developing of tools and this time and people spend more and more time on one thing, new aspects of research, new aspects of real time uh, re reality coming in. So it's, this is kind of development and I wanted to kind of illustrate it, but it goes into the uh, whatever Taos Lee was talking, phases one, two and three maybe, okay? So uh, a little bit history. So I will start with this one, and the history for this one is, is something like that. So you have a kind of big organization, and you you have kind of more research uh, more researchy people, less researchy people. So less researchy people come to you and bring you some kind of file, yeah. So few files, and says we have this gigabyte of this. Can you do something with it? We spend about between half and two billion dollars on that. Can you help? Okay, can you automate it? Can you do something with it? And so your management kind of become very interested and say to you, do. And that's it. So this is kind of general approach and um, for, uh, for general question is something like that. You have a complex problem, yes? Uh, this is a platform, this is one of the applications if you look at simple web page when you're getting some now, nowadays, you have huge amount of application collaborating in order to create one page. For example, if, if you look at kind of Google Google search page, it, I don't know, it, it, there is a bunch of processes hidden on, inside this one search page. And essentially, if, if I'm not mistaken, the search itself takes very small part. The advertising what they put on the page takes maximal amount of time. And they allowed for people to spend about 20 milliseconds of time. Think about it, 20 milliseconds in order to generate your suggestions for the search. If, if you work in Google, you can correct me, I don't know. But this is kind of estimate. So when you look at web page, there is a bunch of application work, working underneath. Even so you kind of scrolling them within a seconds on your phone, that there is some kind of back, back Backside, which looks like a bunch of stuff working together, yeah. And whenever you have this complexity, you you would like to make sure that everything is working proper, yes. You would like to identify problem as soon as something happened. You would like to repair it right away, etc., etc., etc. Yeah. So this is the general goal, yeah. And uh, approach to keeping this thing working, uh, you can kind of outline for me in step. You can consider system footprint and monitor system footprint to see what exactly query, by querying the system itself. For example, you, you can make sure that the disk space is not more than something, that memory uh, utilization by specific application is not more than something, etc. So you're looking on the application from system point of view. Another thing, you can actually query something, each subcomponent sub -component with specific query. For example, Look at, uh, you have a database working somewhere, yes? You can create a database and if make sure that, for example, database is not locked uh, by measuring time for some kind of test uh, query running against database. This is another thing. Or you can query how a web, 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 uh, web server is working by querying some kind of simple page, make sure that web server is actually responding. This is everything, you can do it by hand, but it's usually done by monitoring software, so these two are kind of relatively simple to implement, or this is a standard way. There is a bunch of software which actually does it, Tivoli Tech, I don't know how it's called nowadays, 
Um, so uh, there are a bunch of them, which are good. But uh, also you would like to see it from different uh, from from inside. And in this for this purpose, you actually try to look at the whatever output each subcom subcomponent generates you, and it will be some kind of form of law and try to figure out the status of application based on the generated law, yeah? Another slide is done by complaint by customer. So if you have a customer or you have a user and they try to use something, for example, you, you are the customer and trying to buy something on Amazon, suddenly you, your money disappears, you have a kind of no, no response page and you are kind of furious because your money disappears, so you kind of trying to contact them and tell them, you know, where is my money? So there are customer complaints they create, and this is only customer to to the business, but there is also business to business uh, com uh, interaction between customer com for customers complaining. This is kind of more serious because between business to business they have some kind of agreement which says you couldn't screw more than say 0.1 percent of my flow, otherwise pay penalty or something like that. This is for a service level uh, agreement. So again, uh, this first tool is kind of nice. Uh, log and tickets, uh, I think Charlie started to talk about it or outline some problem. This kind of research problem, there is a bunch of them, so this is one tool. But now again, let's go back to situation that you have a bunch of files, you need to figure out something and make sure that your main goal is kind of still in, in place and you're trying to address it, yeah? Uh, looking forward, and I think in some form Tauli was talking about it, uh, the problem is still open, yes? We could not guarantee 100% that we know precisely if that application is working or not, or not working, and the problem is still there, yes? So this is the actual problem, and it generates a bunch of research and a bunch of inter interesting things, and it's kind of developing and this time changing the shape, etc., etc., and so on. Okay, so uh, we start with... Uh, when you start analyzing stuff, you start it by hand, look at it, and try to play with it and see what you can do before you do anything. And in this case, the visualization is kind of extremely helpful. As soon as you end up with visualization and you have some kind of intuition and ideas, you try to do some unsupervised learning, trying to deal with actual data sizes that you, are, you have, and to address this actual large volume of information which actually you're dealing with. Uh, I want just to note a little bit about this. So information which is generated by system is actually some kind of it ref not direct reflection of what's going on, yeah? So you have a bunch of transformations before that. So system, system generated events have timestamps, but if you think about it, there is rarely actual, um, we don't know where the actual events or complex events start and when it ends. For example, you don't know precisely the root cause, you're trying to identify it, and whatever disaster you end up with, this will be maybe obvious end, but it may be resolved much earlier. So you don't know precisely kind of whatever you have in databases, for example, you have start transaction, end transaction, and this is where, where your boundaries, time boundaries see, uh -uh. but here, there is very vague start of what's going on and also vague end of the situation. Now, when we started to address it, the situation was approximately like I described. Uh, the guy was saying, Ma, now he's in Google, and George Ellison is now in the University of Waterloo. Uh, so they were given this files to do something, okay? And uh, what was done, uh, it was created a different browser, so by hand we processed some logged files and uh, uh, they were visualized and they have internal memory storage, uh, interactive query building, which was a very nice thing, which speed up things or, or entering of parameters by hand uh, significantly. It had all these videos, it was original version. We go to management, show it, they look at it, look nice. Here's more time, you can more time allocated, you can proceed with your desktop type, uh, what you're doing, and you have also more resources. Here's more five people for you, 
we can use them you know, with the tooth power. So the next version goes and it was implemented on top of visualization framework. Uh, in this time, the, this framework was quite, a, quite an original and impressive. Uh, it was the main developer was David Ravenford. I don't know where it is now. Uh, it was called Diamond. This was licensed to SPSS, big statistical firm, like a, acquired by IBM. It has very rich visualization, uh, special type in memory database, column based, so it was easily extended. Um, very good in memory storage, extended query. And one of the specific interesting one was the color based clearing, so you can uh, mark by special color uh, some, some events, and after that, all of them change. You can uh, do different uh, operations on it. So, this, this is kind of interesting. Uh, even so, it looks originally simple, it's kind of interesting thing you can do. Uh, later, it was uh, extended by David Pell at the time, he was from the University of Waterloo. Uh, and he added visual clearing. Essentially, you look at the graphic, you mark whatever you want to choose, you do drill down based on the square. Uh, it, from the square, it generates a diamond API, and after that, you do, you're going to modify it view. So it, it's kind of round trip research also. Everything is done in order to understand what's going on with the system, how to run and search patterns, etc. It submit make a pretty big, significant time consumption, reduction, etc. So next one, this thing is very was good for initial intuition development, but as with every IDE, I don't know, it's probably not very popular term nowadays, but about 15 years ago, interactive data analysis was very popular. And again, it's very good for developing initial intuition, but it has few drawbacks. One of them is very low throughput. Another one, it's essentially depends from the people who do analysis. More, more advanced people do better analysis. Two different people probably will come out with different results. So there is no consistency of, of the result for IDA. Yes. So uh, the attempt was done in uh, to uh, kind of start off this um, IDA limitations and for even so, the original one, uh, a number of patterns was generated and it's become clear, so it's kind of nice direction for the development. So the next step was uh, building of event miner. Uh, it's part of it was done by myself and Shenzhou, again, on top of uh, framework. And uh, what was done, integrated da data mining, uh, frequent item set, item, data set, and some other algorithms were implemented using visualization. And also we keep this nice feature of round trip uh, pattern discovery uh, intact, okay? So it was submit significant software effort, but it paid off because we generated about 20 plus plus uh, patterns, different types, which when you can see here some of the, this is a picture of view from the browser. This is a few different type of events you can look up uh, according papers, etc. So this is a paper which describes some of the patterns. Again, the slides will be available, yes. They are available now. The latest version will be kind of updated, etc. Please look up if you have interest. Okay. So as soon as we have significant amount of patterns, uh, the bottleneck become different. Originally, we started with by hand processed logs and data, and it, it was a bottleneck because we needed and were able to process much more data than originally we had. So we needed to do some some kind of tool. Uh, we implemented which is called log, uh, generic log adapter. So this is a tool which uh, essentially built uh, in in such a form. Uh, it has it has um, inverse inversion of control pattern, so it's allowed to configure it uh, externally, and it was extensible, and uh, it, it was pipeline, so essentially the log coming in, it's 
taking one by one by one by one uh, log log element, processed it and output it in a certain format. So it's, uh, whenever you have something like that, the, the general format for events was generated. It was called CBE, Common Test Event, and uh, this allowed to to semi-automate log processing for many applications. So again, our process data become of different size and you can find now uh, nowadays this thing uh, in Eclipse Foundation, it's called CFTP framework and if you're interested, you can take a look. So uh, another thing what was interesting, so it had interactive Eclipse based tool. It's again, everything was done in order to sp speed up log processing. Okay. So now uh, let me go and talk a little bit about temporal pattern. Uh, essentially, that's why we do all the stuff, yes. Again, it's one part of the big process. So we're trying to mine event relationship or relation between whatever event we see. Uh, temporal pattern, uh, ideally what we would like for to get we would like to look at what a sequence of symptom event and provide and figure out what is the root cause. Yeah? So if you know that there is a problem, you have a symptom event, symptomatic event, you would like to find the root cause. Uh, this kind of signature or some kind of pattern, uh, this is our wish. It includes very specific information, context specific information. If you abstract of it a little bit, so we are looking for repeating subsequences of events here. Yeah? Uh, here's an example. So host restart. If host is down, then it will be followed by host is up for about in about 10 seconds. Okay. So this is a typical input situation, and the monitoring software catches it. Another one is failure propagation. Link is cut, connection lost, lost connection. This is goes from different end of the uh, query. Uh, and after that, application terminated unexpectedly. There is no connection, and application doesn't work. Uh, if you look at another kind of uh, situation, here you have application heartbeat. So, uh, more, more or less, a reliable application user they have a heartbeat. They kind of query itself on the heartbeat in order to figure out that application is running. If not, then the reboot is done. This is, I think, it's typical for Apache. Uh, web servers, etc., etc. So many uh, server-like application does does have uh, heartbeat. After that, we have some kind of database event. For example, uh, unable to finish transaction, transaction rolled back. Uh, another one is uh, disk capacity. This is from database. This is from uh, system. So it's diff absolutely different type of event. And here you see that suppose your capacity close to limit. You, uh, database couldn't finish transaction by whatever reason it is. It may be running out database space, may, may be running out of log space, etc. And this is the time space, okay? So if you look at this, uh, you would expect something like that, that this capacity, and within this capacity uh, alert, you can end up within five or six minutes, then the database event will happen, and five, six minutes here, is a lag of lag interrupt. So if you have a regular load on database, it usually produces a certain amount of uh, database operations, which is supposed to be logged, for example, yes? So insert or update or different type of simple database operation. And as soon as uh, database, amount of database operation is over a certain limit, then it probably may require some additional disk space. And in this case, uh, it goes to the disk and the disk space is not there. So it, it tried to abort the transaction, which actually it was not, try, not, was not able to uh, uh, commit the transaction. Yeah? So this is a situation how it may happen. Uh, what it reflects here, why we have situation with varying time, etc., that it reflects some kind of hidden process. In this case, database update or inserts. And Usually you have a bunch of small operations like that. And in the situation when you have a lot of small operations, you end up with 
has a normal distribution or if it is with good uh, relation between uh, different pro process parameters, you end up with Poisson distribution. But here it probably looks like normal distribution, which we will use later. So if we talk about uh, temporal data mining, usually when it's considered, the people took just fixed sliding, fixed time sliding window. So the size of the sliding window for the different patterns was usually fixed. Yes? And after, the idea was, I think somebody mentioned it, just make the window big enough and probably you will cover all the possible dependency and you are done. Okay? But it has kind of different problem. Uh, it's time window probably dependent on what type of uh, pattern you are looking for. Uh, some patterns may be longer than your chosen window size. Some of them are too, too small for the chosen window size. So you will get probably something which is of, there is no actual dependency, you will get false positive in this case, etc. So these kind of uh, problem related to the uh, choice of uh, sliding window size is what we will be talking later. So one of the approaches is distance clearer and uh, another thing is can we do it in, in a kind of a regular way? Can we assume that the, the size of the window will be kind of random? This is what you would actually expect. So you would like to introduce randomness in the size of window and try to address it in this case. Okay, try to address it. Uh, some of the papers using this approach probably started with Volkov Tau, Lee, KGB 2004, etc. And it's going on. This is only kind of local references, but the veil probably is significantly bigger. Okay, so. We talk about time dependency, why it's important. Uh, another problem uh, is the same picture. Uh, like I talked before, but you have a uh, hard disk database, disk capacity. So you had a disk capacity. And uh, here's another problem. Uh, the problem of disintegration. Uh, you have disk capacity, and after that you have a bunch of uh, database events. So the question is, which event uh, relates to which of the, what is the correspondence? So what is the correspondence? For this A, which of these actually uh, relate to it, okay? We would like to make sure that there is no kind of, maybe this B or this B arise not because of this restriction, but because of the previous event, yes? Uh, you can interpret it properly give a proper interpretation, but essentially this is a typical disintegration uh, problem which is supposed to be uh, addressed somehow. Uh, in addition, uh, there are different type of patterns. You can see it five of here. Uh, and similar questions, what we will be considering here, will be considered for these patterns. If you're interested, you can contact Tauli if you will help you to set up questions and if you're interested in looking into this, you will get proper references and you can start working on it. Okay, so this is a challenge with uh, finding time lag. So again, if uh, time, so time lag, you can, time lag is essentially our sliding window size. Uh, so if the sliding window is too large, then every A and B become dependent and you actually lose the sense of it. If it's too small, you can lose actual real dependency between A and B. Uh, if you start to calculate uh, time complexity for this operation, uh, it will be order of n to four, and you, if you're looking for uh, size of data of millions, so it's clear that there is no chance you can do it with brutal force, you need to come up with some kind of nice algorithm to address it in much better time. Okay, so now uh, here is a some kind of uh, what we consider as qualified lock interval. So this is 
So again, our notation is this, A follows B, and B is supposed to follow A uh, in the interval between C1 and C2, and our kind of idea to find what is the value for C1 and C2 is. So this is kind of interesting because we say uh, in order to actually get to B, you need to at least wait for time T1, and after that, all the Bs which after the time T, they're probably not related to B, okay? So this is, again, this is interesting because as uh, I think Tauli giving an overview, uh, that this actually says if you have A, and here you have some kind of B, which before T1, then probably it's kind of random event and it will disappear, okay? So this is kind of cut off, which we have here, you don't need to do action. After that, starting from T1 to T2, you expect it to do some action, and probably after T2, you have either different event generating B, or it's also some kind of random event which on, on which you probably don't need to react. Okay, so this is a form, and we try to do some kind of initial analysis of what's going on when we try to change T1 and T2. So, uh, one of the easy observations here is that if you fix left hand and you start making T2 bigger, then the number of appearances of patterns become bigger and bigger and bigger, yes? It's kind of obvious, and this table is kind of confirm it. Just fix left end and it will be like this. Okay? So, in order to estimate uh, patterns, what you actually can get, one of the first steps you would like to do, you would like to make sure that it's not just a random occurrences. Okay? And in order to estimate random occurrences, you can use more or less a uh, standard approach. Uh, suppose you have two types two type of things happening, and you would like to make sure, how would you figure out if they're independent between each other? You create high square score, you calculate score, if the score is big enough, then probably, I don't remember, if the, if the score is big enough, then the event's probably random. Yes. And if the score is small, then there is a very good chance that they probably somehow depend on each other, yes? So, if you apply this approach to this special uh, uh, background when you have time and you have two types of event, event A and B, you end up with something like formulas what we have here in order to calculate chi square. So again, the, the standard chi square approach works for uh, not time dependent events, yes? But here we also have one uh, axis which is time, and this introduces us to special consideration based on uh, inter uh, providing the special log, log for the times uh, occurring uh, of interdependent events. Okay, so this is a kind of naive approach. So if you just try to do it by hand uh, without any much of thinking, when we try to calculate it, we end up with a uh, time cost of about n to the fourth. This is more or less explained why you get n to the fourth. And after that, it says, and you couldn't handle big, si big size of data. Uh, imagine that you have millions, even you know, hundred thousand of data. Suppose you have all the possible nowadays uh, cloud machine you can imagine. So you imagine you have 100,000 machines. If, if you have 100,000 events and you are able to process, I don't know, 1,000 per second, then you end up with pretty big number because of this n to the fourth degree. Okay. Even in, when you scale it what, on the way of you want to. Okay, so this says that uh, in order to figure out appropriate log, or appropriate window size in this case, you need to do a little bit more than just brute force. Now, this is a, uh, this is a kind of summarizing uh, slide, and also we talk about 
some kind of specific data, yes? So the data was looked at uh, from IBM customer monitoring events, and this is a specific data, and this is actual data was, was prepared for further analysis when the actual algorithm and everything was done. Uh, another kind of issue here is uh, we do have interleaving. Some kind of naive approach would be suppose you don't want any interleaving, so if you have event A, event B will be next. You have this event type A, second one, it will be next, B, etc., etc., etc. But it may, may happen that they interleave with each other. It creates additional analysis. So we need to have some kind of additional tool which allow us to take into account that we have this A and but B actually related to it in like here. Yeah, so we need to describe this somehow too. Okay. Now if we look at how the events look like, so we think this, for example, uh, this is periodic heartbeat event. If you look at uh, different events, not necessarily this one, but uh, it looks like this one. So the, the idea here is actually generate that uh, kind of uh, support the idea that it, uh, for lag or for specific event or for window size of specific event, you can expect decomposition like that. So you have some kind of window which is there, and after that, this is average. And somewhere around the average, you have variation of, of lags, and the variation of lag you can probably model somehow with normal distribution of certain spread variance, and this is your average. Yeah. So just by looking at specific, uh, this one probably not the best picture because it's heartbeat and uh, it's specifically generated in special times. But nevertheless, even for this event, you can see that it's starting to vary because of. It may vary because of uh, load of the computer, etc., etc. So there are multiple um, uh, reasons why it's starting to to vary. But even for this event, which is supposed to be in, done in predefined time, this is how usually the heartbeat is done. You see the variation. Yes. Yeah? So this shows that this is kind of important to take into account. So again, looking back to this picture, our approach will be. Uh, we go from A to B, we have some kind of uh, distribution uh, de described by mu, and uh, mu here is a constant or average, and in order to make it more realistic, we describe it by L, this is our distribution, and here mu is a constant, epsilon will be some kind of normal uh, error or no, some kind of Gaussian small distribution varying around the zero. This is our assumption. Uh, in other words, we can write down L as normal with average mu and some kind of uh, standard deviation sigma. Okay, now uh, going back to attempt to describe in interleaving event. What we do, we introduce variable, the idea which essentially says that I event implies J event B. And this is event which actually takes zero or one value, yes, and it has certain distribution that all the events, so if you start from this one, there is a probability of uh, getting any of these events, but some, when you sum up from this event, you can get only for one of these B events. Yes. So this is what the last equation explains. Now, uh, this is a standard method of solving that. Uh, so, first of all, we combine everything into one log likelihood expression. And you can see it on this left side. This is a product of two different distributions. This is a normal distribution. This is a time difference between event i and dj. And this is a probability of what if i event j is generated based on event i, and after that we have a two parameters, mu and sigma, what we talked about, and this is our, when we uh, take a logarithm and sum them up, 
you will end up with Lloyd Clarkson who is expression and the idea is to use uh, maximum load likelihood principle which is useful in many many statistical methods uh, in order to find it okay so this is the expression you're looking for bf mu values of mu and sigma in order to find maximum of this load likelihood expression a typical approach in order to solve this expression is using um, expectation of minimization, it's called expectation minimization algorithm. You can just change sign to minus instead of maximization problem, you end up with minimization. So those are typical steps of the problem. So loop until converge or until error between two different iterations remains small. This is how we calculate uh, expectation. We fix uh, existing values of mu, mu prime and sigma prime. We calculate what is the probability of getting from i to j. And after that, we vary values. We, based on this expression, define the best values of parameters, uh, which are supposed to be parameters of mu and sigma. And here you use this expression already. And this, and here is analytical expression. If you have Rij, then the mu will be just sum like that. And variance of sigma squared will be expression like this. Okay? So this is analytical expression as soon as you have that. And you repeat this many, many times up until the values mu and sigma starting to converge. And this is a typical uh, EM method approach. Uh, if you calculate how good it is or how bad it is, uh, the time, ex uh, time complexity is number of iteration, number of events A, number of events B. Okay. Uh, when, we, when this one was done and evaluated versus uh, practical or, or synthetic data, it turns out that this method is kind of slow and it gives slow convergence. So we needed to tweak it a little bit in order to get a better result. So how would we tweak it? You try to relax it, yes? Yeah? So you have some kind of uh, very, uh, this is strict mathematical expression, this is strict mathematical expression. You try to kind of relax it, make it less precise, introduce some kind of error, and you expect that because of your relaxation, uh, you will get better performance of the or better convergence of the algorithm, yes? This is a typical approach, again. Uh, so this is the relaxation, so let me go to the next slide, I think it's better. Describing. So we take some kind of k possible pairs, we don't take everything, we take only part of it, but we control everything with the total error of epsilon. So when we go, uh, so if we take this ai, and we consider where we can get from this AI, we take only k pairs, and we look over all possible pairs starting from A, make sure that the high is big enough that the total error does not exceed it. Okay? So this is a typical approach of relaxation. Uh, we remove very low effective tasks, and instead we can concentrate on more probable situation, but in this case, we simplify problems significantly. Yes, instead of uh, infinite loop, instead of summing up for infinite number, or big number of bees, we kind of concentrate on most probable bees. So uh, this uh, method was evaluated on two different types of data: synthetic data where noise and true loss. We took it true loss, added some noise, and trying to make sure that our uh, algorithm actually recover uh, the actual truth. And it turns out it's working properly. And another type of data was uh, analysis of real data from, uh, which was generously given by IBM. Uh, comparison was done using uh, kuhlberg leibler divergence. And here the interesting part is that when we talk about error, uh, if we allow bigger, uh, bigger, or uh, in this case, epsilon, if you recall, epsilon was kind of size.
size of the window is very low. So if you take window size very small here, if the window size is very small, then very few of these actually get inside, yes? So the dependency will be very restricted. If the epsilon is big, then much more, and if you have very few bits, then you are, you're speeding up the algorithm, yes? This is your expectation. If you have a uh, size of appropriate bits big, then your algorithm will slow down. So here, going to the evaluation, if uh, this is a different evaluation uh, between this, uh, between LAGM and RELAC for ATP LAGM, uh, there are a few different markings here. Uh, this is the size of, of the actual data. And this is LAGM, it's precise algorithm. This is a relaxed algorithm with excellent choice of corresponding to 1,000. And this is a uh, excellent choice of 5% and 10%. Okay, so you see the result. They're pretty close, so relaxation doesn't destroy everything too much, and uh, this is a performance. You can see that uh, this is lag EM, this is very kind of high one, and up lag EM, you can see that the performance approximately um, twice as good. Okay. Uh, one more thing here, what I want to tell is that if we talk about this thing, uh, there is a sanity pattern that we would like to make sure are present when we do analysis. And the two of them are here. Uh, let me come in quickly about this one. So we have periodic pattern between 10 seconds. Uh, AIX is operating system by Linux type operating system, high end by IBM. And essentially what it does, it's query if the, if the server is up. If not, it repeats the query again within 10 seconds time to figure out when uh, the server will be up. If it is up, then it gives big time, wait big time for running another query. And it, it actually found this situation that this repeated uh, query for field AX server was repeated within 10 seconds. And you see here uh, the actual uh, mu in the pattern was 10.92 and the uh, standard deviation was very close to one. Okay, so this sanity check shows that it's working properly. Uh, let me kind of uh, very briefly describe additional work. Uh, so as soon as you have figured out relatively nicely what to do with, uh, maybe I will say one more word about. So this work for lag identification helped to find lag window. And you remember the first parameter which says, what happened before probably doesn't have any action. So this was used in order to do some kind of optimization of actual work and resulted in kind of pretty nice savings. Am I correct? Okay, so uh, the next thing is uh, event summarization. And the idea here is, so when you run pattern, you and if you've done it ever for actual data, you end up with something like that. It's a bunch of uh, relation, very difficult to figure out what's going on and try to do something. So the idea here, in order to find something which actually makes sense, is to do some kind of summarization. And I will briefly, very briefly go. So uh, the approach to, to go from something like that to something which makes realistic sense is uh, to, to try to do some workflow like this. So you start with event sequence, you ge generate event. Here you see histogram for each, event, for, for each event which happening. After that you probably try to do pruning and remove very kind of unlikely uh, histograms. You end up with much sparser graph. You go from graph and find pattern in actual event sequence and you generate uh, what, what is called ERM event relation event relationship network, and this kind of C is a constant which actually describes how uh, probable is one uh, effect uh, generate another. So you end up with some kind of graph which is with the relationship go, uh, shows in certain direction. Okay. 
And when, when you do that, in, so this is a work which was done in this thing, and the idea is you generate a bunch of pattern, which of them does make sense. You can look up literature. Again, slides available online. Uh, and essential part here is uh, you remember that we do have different size of windows in this case, and it would be interesting to see uh, how this change of the windows, uh, the pattern actually will change, and uh, different pattern probably will have different uh, you know, windows parameters. So this is done with multi-resolution event summarization, 2014 uh, SDM paper. You can look up if you're interested. Uh, this is kind of interesting work. It was special framework created. Uh, it has different parameters, about 10 basic operations and five tasks. And you can common, co create command line description, run it, and it does summarization for you. Please take a look if you're interested. OK. So in how much time do I have? Two minutes? Is it? Over time? OK. So I, I just tell a little bit. Uh, another kind of approach to the same problem of cho choosing uh, time distribution description is uh, described in this uh, paper. Uh, it's more general situation, trying to give to build very generic model in this case. And um, uh, essentially, it looks like this. This is your kind of time window. Here you take pretty big description of the time window, and after that, trying to make it smaller. This is your possible events which you can see, yes? And this is a possible dependency of what you see. And it turns out, and it makes absolute sense, that when you kind of move this time, there are a few different things may happen. First of all, your uh, strength of relationship, yes? Or frequency, how frequently one imply another may change. And this strength of relationship here is marked by thickness of the line. This is one thing. Another thing is it may happen that uh, the direction or relation actually appear or disappear. Okay? This is another thing. And another thing is that when we do that, there is a special effect of sparsity, meaning comparing to the whole time timeline, this thing is relatively sparse, okay? So the pattern, what you can see, that has a limit, limited number of elements, much less than size of the window, and much less, of course, than the whole time, time frame, time, time horizon. So and this is supposed to give you sparsity, okay? So this is essential moment. Now, if we talk about uh, sparse consideration, what was suggested, th there were a bunch of work uh, about sparsity, yes? And uh, this is one of the work. Uh, lastly, is a t when, whenever you hear the word sparsity, you probably hear it together with lasso. Lasso is one of the methods which actually help you establish uh, sparsity. Uh, uh, first, it was discovered by, in paper probably by uh, Donahoe and Johnson. Johnson is from, used to be from when he was a student at Columbia. Uh, Donahoe still is in Stanford. Uh, so this is about last, uh, not lasso, but pre-lasso, when they figure out that whenever you do L1 optimization, then you end up with something which is very low dimension compared to everything else. It's stable, it's blah, blah, the whole big amount of Research was done on sparsity, uh, and lasso kind of was a relatively universal answer how you. So there are a bunch of problems. The answer was lasso. Use the lasso, you will get sparse solution. And uh, I think lasso was a Iranian company from Stanford. Uh, so one of the approaches was here, apply uh, this sparsity approach with lasso to the special model. This is a simple graphical model, which was uh, the author here. This is a paper reference. We're able to simplify. So here you can see dependency. This is actual kind of dependency of the data. This is a parameter. The parameters itself has de dependent on certain parameters which are outside. This is independent variable. This is a total sum. 
And after that, the idea is, can you figure out the optimization of this model based values of parameters, uh, making sure that you have, you use very small amount of uh, parameters, meaning your, your model is sparse. And uh, again, when you do that, this is a description of model of authors here. When you do that, you use lasso and you try to do optimization, etc. A uh, bunch of book written, uh, I think, lately on sparsity and LASA, probably four or five books you can find easily. Uh, returning to our question, this is a model description. When you go and specialize it, you end up with something like that. So here, you take the weight, you decompose it on constant part, and the part which one of the part is normal distribution, so it's small size. Another one is, this is a shift, uh, existing or removing existing lean. This is uh, actually describing how far you can go, window size, etc. So this is actual model. Again, when you talk class, you're talking about minimizing something using L1 regulator. This is L1 node. And this is a model which we were uh, which come out, out of original question. It's a little bit different from original one, as you can see. Uh, it's a little bit more complex, but this is a model. It turns out uh, it may be solved using uh, particle learning. And the idea behind particle learning is as follows. On its iterative method, it runs one iteration, it changes settings for parameters, it runs another one, etc. So the beautiful part of particle learning is that on each step, as soon as your iteration uh, run, you have two things. First of all, you have some kind of solution for the parameter, which become better and better more iteration you run. And the second thing, you, can est you have an estimate on error. So these two things you can keep, and this is, this is good because in principle you can run it forever or until it converts. If it's not converged, you can stop it at any time and get some kind of two nice estimates and solution and kind of, this is kind of two beautiful thing from particle learning. So this particle learning was used for this uh, optimization problem and uh, the method was called CV lasso and this is evaluation on actual data and you can see that CV lasso was, here is one of the best methods which was exist in some form. Okay.